Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome to the continuing lecture series for the second semester here at William Patterson University, spring semester 2016. Today, we're lucky to have Marina Zerkow. Oh, I'm sorry. I always have to say that we have another visiting artist lecture on March 9th, and that is Mary Mattingly. So she'll be here on March 9th and doing the same kind of lecture. We've got kind of an ecological theme going on this semester. So uh, today we're really happy to have Marina Zerkow. I've known Marina for a while because I think, I think we might have met at a Creative Capital retreat. I think that's where we met. Um, she's an American visual artist based in New York who works with media, technology, animation, and video. Her subject matter includes individual narratives, environmental concerns, and reflections on the relation between space, species or between humans, animals, plants, and the weather. Her artworks have been in solo exhibitions at Diverse Works in Houston, Texas, and at FACT in Liverpool. Zerkow is the recipient of a Creative Capital Grant and has had fellowships from the Guggenheim and the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, I want to tell you all that she also has a show up right now in New York City at Bitforms Gallery, which is on Ludlow and... Uh, Alan and Delancey. Sorry, Alan and Delancey. Alan and Delancey. Bitforms Gallery. Definitely worth seeing. How long will it be up for? Till April 3rd. Till April 3rd. So you got plenty of time to go see it. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Marina Zerkow. Thanks. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me. Um, you're really in for a treat that Mary's coming. She's awesome. I really like her work. Um, so I just opened this show a week ago, so I'm a little bit unpre unprepared. And so this will probably be the most conversational talk I've ever tried to give. <laughs> so I'm going to try to show you some of the new work, and I, I really hope that you can come to see the show. It's a fairly tactile, experiential show. It's a little bit hard to just see in pictures. And uh, it's good that I'm telling you what it's about, which I'll, I'll kind of do last in the sequence of things, because it is one of the most <laughs> mystifying uh, and complex codified systems that dominate the oceans. And so you may see that and think, I don't understand what this has to do with environmentalism. So I'm going to try to back up a little bit and then take you through some sequence of work. Some of the work is like you're seeing this piece this is from 2009. It's a piece called Slurb. Uh, it was a commission for the city of Tampa. And what you're seeing in the background is the city of Tampa, uh, which is on the Gulf of Mexico. And normally the way that I work is I'll do a ton of research. And then um, uh, at the same time that I'm doing a lot of research, we'll simultaneously sort of follow threads of instinct and hope that those twains <laughs> will meet. And I don't end up having to throw away an enormous amount of work. But sometimes that's what happens. Uh, so with this piece, this isn't the last video that I made. I, I came out of video animation, and now I do mostly software-driven animation work and media work. I do dinners, and I do social practice, kind of pr public participatory engagement projects to augment the more enchanting media work that I do that wasn't exact. It, it does its own thing. It's tremendously seductive. It's colorful. It draws you in, and then maybe you'll encounter some uncomfortable subject matter. But uh, the work definitely has its limitations in terms of actually connecting people to issues in material ways, which has become more and more important to me as somebody concerned with the way that we relate to the rest of the environment. I wouldn't say the environment, because that would presume that we're outside of that. So we're so not outside of any of that. So how do you sort of amplify these relationships between humans and non-human animals, uh, between humans and fungus, between humans and microbes, between humans and what Timothy Morton, the philosopher, would call you know, the hyper-object of the climate. Sort of how do we encounter those things? And art is really good at that because you, have, you can leverage visual languages, you can leverage non-linear. It's, it's, it's even sometimes very hard for me to stand up here and try to linearly describe to you what's happening in this work because the work is really determined to be kind of an experiential, po poetic thing that doesn't necessarily unspool really cleanly in language. Um, so, yeah, this, this piece, what you're seeing is you're seeing the city of Tampa, you're seeing the St. Pete Bridge, and then you're seeing piles of garbage, you're seeing uh, fishermen, fisherwomen harvesting jellyfish. So one of the things that I discovered is that the Gulf of Mexico since the 80s uh, has gone through tremendous uh, ecological changes, one big one being that people used to harvest a lot of shrimp. It was, you know, if you think about Gulf cuisine, it was very shrimp heavy. Shrimp are one of the signal species that's declined as a result of agricultural runoff, ocean acidification, ocean temperatures changing, 
um, and a bunch of other factors, not to mention uh, disasters like the Deepwater uh, Horizon spill. So um, I looked at cultures that traditionally live on the water, cultures that um, from all over the world and kind of created this speculative fantasy space that's, that implies that there was some kind of an apocalypse that happened and now you're really on the other side of that. Who is surviving? What are they eating? How are they, how are they sort of encountering their environment? Uh, and I'll just shuttle ahead um, in the piece. And so, so the piece runs sort of linearly through the spatial geography of Tampa out to the St. Pete's Bridge and then into the suburbs and then the piece is, is a continuous scroll. So it's 18 minute, but it's a loop with no beginning and end. So it ends up back where it started with this squid headed girl dancing. And um, you can see sort of down at this end in the suburbs, these people who um, are less connected to the waterways than the people who are actually able to sort of fish with their legs. They would call the, the Inlay Lake, um, the, the, the people who live on these now polluted lakes in Cambodia and Laos called Inle Lake. Uh, and the other thing about this work at the time was that everything that you're seeing was videos that I was finding on YouTube. So I made about 11 videos, animations that are all rotoscoped. So they're, they're really simply traced videos and then collaged into a, a kind of a unified, semi-unified environment that you see in the video. So they look really like authored, they are authored, they're collages in a sense, or brick collages, because I was really interested in what kind of material you could find on the internet to use really quite, uh, that we might all on some level have encountered at stock footage websites or in Google searches and some subliminal level. And you see it, you don't see it so much in this piece as in another piece that I did um, called The Poster Children. Um, and all of the stuff's on my website, so I'm, the video stuff I'm not really showing you a ton of because you can watch it all online. But with the poster children, it was the classic picture of it came out when Al Gore made an inconvenient truth of the stranded polar bears on the one little ice floe. And the truth behind that is a lot more complicated than it seems. And it was a picture that on some level, even though I had repositioned the picture in this whole fantasy environment, was still a picture that would resonate for you. So this idea of images as kinds of territory, as recognizable components that you can use was, was of great interest to me at the time. And the soundtrack for this, I was working with a composer who eventually I think I drove crazy. Um, once the work stopped being linear, he came out of making quite linear pieces. Once I wanted to do nonlinear work that was gonna recombine, it became a lot harder for him to compose. We did have some success, but what you're hearing are kids' voices and computer voices singing out the colloquial names of all these different kinds of jellyfish. So the piece, in a sense, was an ode to this creature that I'm really, really interested in, in general, and for reasons I'll explain maybe if there's time at the end of the talk about what I'm doing this spring. I'm on break from NYU where I teach, so uh, I'm, I'm going back to the Gulf for two months to do some research on jellyfish and eating them and eating them in different ways and using eating as a way of connecting people to climate change. Uh, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Yes. The technique for video imagery of the jellyfish interests me. Uh -huh. um, because they seem, I don't know if they're solarized. They don't, can you describe? Yeah, so these, these pieces are, all of the characters are, were, were rotoscoped using flash, yeah. which, and then the, everything is composited in this piece in After Effects. So I ended up maybe with 60 or 70 layers of material, water, jellyfish, footage footage that I got from Tampa, news sites of floods that had happened there, and then kind of, comp I just composited all of that. Uh, I can't tell you if it was solarized or it was some kind of manipulation of all the After Effects stuff that you can manipulate to make things semi-transparent or wash them out. I mean, this was a period of time I was really interested in p digital paint animation as painting. And these pieces actually are sold as works you hang on the wall. So if you buy a piece, the idea is that you would buy a piece and put it in your living room and it would play continuously on a player. So the terms of that, and I'm very happy to talk about the kind of business of what I do or how I fund my work. If you're interested, just ask me, you know, in context to all of this. Because there are a lot of different kinds of funding structures, a lot of different kinds of 
self-management structures, how to run a, st I now run a studio with other people who work there. And, um, you know, I'm certainly not rich. So funding all of this and make balancing the more social practice work with the more sales driven work is really interesting. On the other hand, this piece never, this piece has been shown a lot and only one person has bought it. So it's, I guess, a piece people don't really want to live with. <laughs> Which I think is interesting. So when you say um, you run a studio, you mean you have a fine art studio where a piece like this is made, but you also do commercial work? No, no, no. I just met, I run like a, pro I have a product, I still, I operate in a production model, a research and making model, and I have people who work with me or had, we're actually now in a big shift at the studio. Many of the people who come in as assistants end up as collaborators. So <laughs> things are shifting right now. We're just, I feel like this show that opened this week uh, was kind of a, the mark of like a, a really big new research project on oceans. And so I'm rethinking the way that I'm doing things and who I'm doing them with. So, so that's that. Um, okay. So I'm going to jump ahead to uh, 2011. I'm just going to show you some stills. It's just a, I'm sorry, these are like folders of images, but uh, I'll talk fast and z tell me to slow down if it's, if it's too much. Um, I did a big body of work under the title Necrocracy um, that I started in West Texas in 2011. I got a, a research grant to travel uh, and look at the Texas landscape through the lens of what's below the ground, petroleum, and what's above the ground, what they call the Big Empty in northwest Texas. Not the pretty part, not Big Bend, not Marfa, but north of there where George Bush is from, Midland. It's the, bless you, on, it's the land, it's the, ca it, so Houston is the ca oil capital of the United States for corporations. Midland is the petroleum drilling capital. That's where all the companies sort of coalesce. A lot of family-run businesses, small oil company stuff. It's very ugly to most people. It's historically unlivable. Not even Native people live there because there's not enough water. They would come to, it's an ecotone. It's between ecological environments and people would come and trade when it was spring and there were acorns and to, to harvest and some water to be had. And now, you know, there's a ton of people living there and it's all oil-centric production. Um, so I spent two weeks driving around and I kept a blog which is linked to my website which I'll do again next month when I go back to Texas um, as a way to sort of transcribe and focus what I found out at any given day. It's a lot of photos, a lot of, I do a lot of interviews with people and I started doing this because I found that just doing studio-based research was producing like enormous bias and I was really interested in um, challenging that and, and perhaps finding the validity of other voices, the reality of truth on the ground. Because when I thought about West Texas oil fields, I thought of, you know, a pitch black smoke stripper evil place just filled with these pump jacks 24-7. It's nothing like that. It's, it's gray. It's boring, it's open, there's a lot of animal life, you have to look for it, it's extremely subtle, but the subtleties started to really interest me. So out of this research grant, I had a solo show at um, Diverse Works, which is a um, kind of like the kitchen in New York, a public art and performance space big in Houston, and I put the show together. The, the title necrocracy uh, means governance by the dead, and it's a, a term that I found in a book called Dominions of the Dead by a classicist named Robert Pogue Harrison. And he made an argument that uh, Western civilization from Greco-Roman period and probably even before has always been uh, dominated by ancestor worship. We've always looked to the dead. In fact, the first cities were necropoli. Uh, and I, at the time, was reading also a lot of Bruno Latour, who's an anthropologist philosopher who makes a case for non-human agency uh, and that everything has agency. It's not human agency like, oh, this aluminum wants to have water in it, but that everything has a kind of an energy or a will to collude based on chemistry or based on atomic, the kind of nature of particles, particle physics even, wants to do certain things in the world. And it was a way to think about the world differently, to think about non-humans differently. So as a, an artist, to have like a new language to um, 
sense the world, to appreciate what the world is doing, was a way to start to take apart what's known as human exceptionalism. Is that term familiar to anybody besides you? So human exceptionalism is, is a very much a sort of Cartesian enlightenment idea that humans, and before that as well, but it was really solidified in the 1600s. Humans at the top of the heap, science, rationale, top of the heap, everything else at our service. Endless resources, stuff for us to have. You know, we run everything, everything else is kind of like down there. Humans, culture, everything else, nature. So a lot of people have been trying to work in the last 25 years to take that apart, to say what's, what comes after humanism? What comes after literally where the term humanities comes from? What's post-humanities look like? I know it sounds super academic, but the translation of that's been really important to me to figure out how you take these concepts and ideas and actually translate them to things that people can access. So maybe I will show you some stuff. <laughs> Um, so one of the things I did is I looked at this landscape and I said, well, what's on this landscape? You have animals, you have oil under, you have birds, you have rain sometimes, rarely. You have people who have to clean up all these disasters that happen, like people in hazmat suits. So I got really interested in hazmat culture. And one of the things I did for the show is I made several of these um, little hazardous material suits for children. And again, it's this sort of speculative, playful fiction what if everybody has to clean things up? Things are so bad that even your kids have to wear hazmat suits and clean up oil spills. Irony also is um, the suits are made out of petroleum, but they're also designed to clean up petroleum. So these are replica suits made out of the real material. You could put a child in this and they would, um, they would survive. So I'm just, I'll shuttle through the installation and talk a little bit about some of the design decisions and I'll show you a little bit of the video work from, um, from the piece. So this is one video piece that was in the entry once you kind of left the little greeting guys in the front and um, it, I'll show you the video but it's a piece called Hydrocarbons. It's lit it was lifted from a 1959 promo for gasoline and um, I'll show you in a sec what I did with it. Uh. Then when you walked past this sort of red wall, you ended up in, in this labyrinth of nine foot high banners um, that we printed on Tyvek. And the idea was Tyvek is petrochemical plastic, but at the end of the show, it wouldn't just be thrown in the garbage. People signed up and adopted the banners and took them home and did whatever they wanted with them. So that pieces would have some kind of life beyond just discard. Um, everything you see on the banners is uh, made out of petrochemicals. And I organized the show by different kinds of petrochemicals. So there are things made out of nylon, things made out of um, PET, things made out of HDPE, things made out of polyisobutylene, which is rubber, nitrile, all the rubber substitutes. And this became a book uh, ultimately called the Petroleum Manga. M manga, this is sort of in a sense how this started. I wanted to make a book that was a book of what manga used to be, was uh, simple sketches, playful simple sketches that in many cases the artists, the woodblock artists who did manga in the 1700s um, had really weird ways of organizing things. So there'd be shingles, a page of shingles, and then a page of owls, and then a page of squirrels, and then a page of pearl diving swimmers. So it was really odd and beautiful books. And I went to the New York Public Library and I saw, you know, I got to touch like the 13 volumes of Hokusai's like manga from the 1700s. I was super inspired to try to make this project. But it took a while to make the book. The book now you can get on Amazon which is awesome. And the book is all of these things organized by petrochemicals, 160 objects, and then I invited 40 writers to respond to either the pictures or the petrochemicals. And they're fiction writers, poets, science writers, and philosophers. So it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool project. So Marita, could you, you're drawing, you're generating all these drawings, right? Yeah. And, and uh, what's your process of doing that? I'm tracing stuff. Tracing stuff? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. But they're also part of the games, or part, part of a, a media space too, the drawings, or not? What, what do you mean? Case, no. what do you, oh, part of the animation yeah. space? No, right. Right. not at all. Okay. No, this ended up, it, I like to work modularly, so the drawings ended up as wallpaper and some other exhibition versions of the show. They've ended up as big banners. They've ended up as exterior banners in Mexico City as part of a show that had to do with oil and energy. Um, and so interspersed as you walk through this labyrinth made out of paper were other videos. This was a piece about pump jacks and water fountains, you know, and a very simple video piece to channel. Uh, and 
there were several other videos, which I'll get to in a second, but you kind of get a sense of the space, at least, in these pictures. Um, so there was a side room called Neo Geo, and in this room were four tiny metal boxes hung from the ceiling, and in each of those boxes were four sides of mirror, and then these drawings of just a drill, endlessly drilling through rock. Um, I will show you that. I'll show you a little bit of that. They're, they're kind of boring and fabulous. So I did these with a colleague of mine who's uh, written all the books on processing the, the visualization language. And these are just physics rules uh, applied to little tiny pieces of rock. So I gave them all these different kinds of rock, porous rock, uh, heavy rock, composite rock, uh, limestone, and shale. And then there were rules, like the drill will respond to the density of those rocks. And if it hits the right moment, there's a chance that those particles, which are oil or gas, will aggregate and you'll get a gush that you'll see on screen. So we did a lot of these at different scales, different kind of depths. And you can see the dense rock, the drill moves really, really slowly. And then it's going to hit the limestone. And I think it's going to move really quickly. Limestone's very porous. So I learned a lot in the process of how oil is formed, which at that time was really interesting to me to have like a structural backbone. I mean, I am a really curious person. Like, I just need to know how things are made. But I also believe in this kind of information becoming like a structural foundation for the work that you do. The work can become super crazy. If you have a really, really solid structural backbone to the work, people will sense it. They'll, they'll feel it in the work, even if they don't know exactly what that is. So, I mean, there were a lot of other things about these, these pieces that was of interest to me. Um, visualizations in the 19th century were very romantic. Um, I can't remember his first name. I always want to call him Timothy Hutton, but it's somebody Hutton who's the first geologist to realize that the earth was made of strata and that mountains came down and earth came up and that it was, he thought it, us, it, he was correct. It is a cycle that goes on forever. Things come down, mountains come down, mountains go up. <laughs> Uh, and he realized this and made these drawings of looking at the rock cuts in uh, wagon routes in Scotland. And so there was these periods of like incredibly beautiful rendering where I think the world was more full of naturalist wonder. Because if you look now at geologic renderings, they're really ugly. They're 3D, they're really dead, uh, they're very clinical, and they just don't have this kind of glitz. And so what I was very interested in, especially like, I met some, finally got to meet some of these oil people. They kind of didn't want to meet me because look at me, <laughs> you know. Uh, but I won over some people's trust, and they're gamblers, you know? It it's costs like $100,000 for every 100 feet you want to drill. And you have no idea, even with all the technology you have now, if you're going to hit oil. It's gambling. And so I was really interested in trying to make a piece that would, on some level, uh, begin to address that. So these infinity boxes that you can kind of put your head in and just be underground, what is the drill bit seeing? This again, this animate, anim, question of animus, what does the drill bit see? We can't ever be in that strata, so how is that visualized? It's the only access you have to that. So I was kind of like, I usually am very filled with wonder in the beginning of projects and then they mutate over time. These are years long projects. This was still very much like the kind of wonder phase. Um, so there was another room, I don't seem to have a picture of it, that had, it was more like a movie theater with car seats on the floor. And uh, it was showing this piece that I'm going to show you. Please don't quit. Yes. OK. This is running live, so you never know. Um, this is uh, a piece called uh, Mesocosm Wink, Texas. And um, Wink was a town I found before I went on that West Texas trip when I was on Google Satellite, just trying to get a sense of, well, what's this like, landscape really like? And it's gray, 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 with little white patches where the pump jacks are. And then there was like one little pitch black dot in the middle of you know, miles and miles and miles of dirt. Turned out this dot was a sinkhole. And the sinkhole had collapsed on oil company land. And um, I found some pictures were called the Wink Sink. So Wink is a town of like 800 people about 60 miles from Midland. And I persisted to get access to the land because I really wanted to see the sinkhole. 
Um, and finally, again, it was one of these like, oh, how do you get somebody to trust that you're not some snoopy, weird New York spy who hates oil people? The county commissioner had the keys to all of these private land holdings, and he let me on this land after I, I had been vetted by a whole number of other people. And I photographed this beautiful, it looked like it had been there for three million years, you know, like a miniature canyon, but was falling in at an incredible rate. The hole opened in 2006, and now it's the size of like a football field, and it's cracking all these roads. So it turns out that sounds like a disaster. I mean, it is, a, it, is a, it is a kind of infrastructure disaster. But it also is limestone, which is, as you saw from how the drill bashes through limestone, extremely porous. That's why they have caverns, like Carlsbad Caverns, and you know, a lot of caving is in limestone. So it's not that unusual, but you probably shouldn't be flushing tons and tons of water through limestone if you want this land to, to stay intact. So I photographed this place, and I thought about it for a while, and I. I realized it was kind of like a tourist destination that could never be a tourist destination. Thus the picnic table, thus the billboard. The billboard only shows weather. Um, and now I'll just explain a little bit about the technology of the piece. So the piece in the, I don't know if you can see the date in the top left, I think this is January 1st, it's 2 a.m. So the piece runs on a clock and the clock is divided into months and times of day, morning, like dusk, d dawn, day, dusk, and night. And so I have these buckets of opportunity to stage events. So all you really see, all that's stable is the stage that you see right now, twinkling stars, uh, the sinkhole itself. But everything like this little rocks, those are all separate actors. So I have like hundreds of actors who then have a certain amount of probability that we've written for them to come out at any given time. So the piece is 144 hours to get through one year. It's, 24, it's a 24 minute day, it's a one minute hour. Does that make sense? So it's a very long, boring piece in many ways. And I used to love this quote from um, a poet named Jack Collum, uh, nature is slow, people get bored. So that was kind of like this operating tenet for me for a few years, like make it boring, slow it down, you know, this is a piece that's meant to be kind of looked at, lived with, left, returned to. It changes very subtly, but quite significantly over time. So for instance, in October, there's a butterfly migration. Suddenly this place is just filled with monarch butterflies. Um, there's windy months on average, very windy months in this part of Texas. So there's hot air balloons, et cetera. So yeah, questions? Is, I'm sorry, is it a lake? It's a sinkhole. But it's, but it's, the it's water. Simple, yeah, okay, that's what I meant. So it's become a lake. And so what we're seeing with the little, is, are those oil gushers that are coming Yeah, out so of obviously, oil? I mean, it took a lot of liberties. Yeah. I mean, it's more like, to me, the Pandora's box or a hole into the other side of the, this world. People very much instrumentalize this part of Texas. It's really good for one thing, and that's what's beneath the ground. And they don't give a shit about what's above ground. And I met one naturalist who was born in Midland. He went to school at Reed, kind of hippie, uh, moved back. And he's like the evangelist for this big empty. He teaches people to go out and photograph it and to appreciate the tiny subtleties. And you know, he took me on some crazy drives um, to the wastewater treatment ponds where filled with sandhill cranes. So like in, in January, there's sandhill crane migrations through here. So the piece definitely has personality over time. But as you can see, you saw, I think, some plastic bags and an owl, like in the time that we've been, we, oh, here's a crow. It's 5 a.m. Things, up. Oh, see, things will change now. It's January, here come some sandhill cranes. Here come some red-winged blackbirds. There's some sound on occasion in the piece. Any other questions? Have I bored you yet? Not at all. Okay. Actually, yeah, actually, yes. <laughs> Question, though. Yeah. I like the spotter the way my, I, I, I look right at the spot of red, which indicates the smokestack and uh -huh. all, all the things linked to that in, in your, um, in, in all the concept and theory behind what you're doing. The red along the edge of the sinkhole, 
Yeah. It, 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 it obviously draws your attention, but is it meant to tell us more? Uh, only in the sense that I was in, I didn't want to make a purely black and white piece, and I was in, I was looking at the way that sandstones pick up color and how you get iron and you get other kinds of minerals. So it's just like the slightest suggestion that the piece isn't black and white. That's really all of its purpose. And again, in a sense, just like Bryce Canyon and those places in Utah, you know, the pinkishness of those rocks. I wanted to slightly uh, bring out the fact that this was like a pretty place. I don't know if it looks pretty to you. Pretty desolate. <laughs> I can't believe we didn't even see a train go by. This is just was one of those moments. I refuse to show canned clips because I'm more interested in how boring they are. But you can see this on my website. And if you just enable cookies, if you quit, it'll remember what day you stopped watching it. So you can actually, and I won't steal anything from you because I'm really not interested at all in cookie mis mischief. <laughs> but you can see the piece over you know, the course of weeks. And there's another one about England, also on my website, about Lee Bowery and Northern England, sort of similarly structured, same software. Here comes a Roadrunner. Mm -hmm. They're awesome. OK. Um, how am I doing on time? Good. OK, I'm not going to show you the hydrocarbons piece, because you can just go look at that. Um, I'll show you one more piece related to this work, um, to this necrocracy work, which was sort of edging into the more social practice. Um, yeah. So I did uh, a couple of big dinners around eating geological time. And so one of the things that Hutton, not the not Timothy Hutton, ge geologist, um, coined was a term deep time. Has anybody heard this? So unimaginable geologic time. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful phrase because it really reminds you how little you can kind of grasp time outside of like five or six generations or if you're Native American, let's say 10. We do things for 10 generations. Um, but I became really interested in what are ways that you can connect to deep time. So I designed this dinner with two chefs in New York called Outside the Work, which is the translation of hors d'oeuvre in French. It's outside the framework of the meal. And I was, I was, I, it's a little bit obscure. I'm not sure it's the greatest title anymore. At the time, I was like, it's the greatest title ever. Um, because I, I think when you go eat a fancy meal, especially if it's ecologically friendly, green, you think you're, you're like off the hook. You know, somehow you've like got to get out of jail free ticket. And you can just kind of sit back. And so I'm really interested in productive discomfort and like figuring out ways that you have pleasure, but they're kind of uncomfortable. So we designed this meal. And the meal basically, um, I'll just shuttle down here for a second. So can you see this? What, should I enlarge this? This structure thing? Can you see this? Yeah. OK, so um, what you see on the left is literally the way oil and gas are formed over millions and millions of years. You know, you get like organic matter, marine microorganisms, they die, they sink to the bottom of like salty lake, the lake dries up, it gets, uh, turns to pure salt, the salt compresses over time, sediment builds up over it, it gets super compressed, you have layers and strata under which you have these, you know, dead, there were big die-offs like the Cambrian, pre-Cambrian, Cambrian era had, was I think the last great extinction, which we're now in the next one. Um, massive die-off, big weather changes, and so, um, presumably, there was a large volume of marine microorganisms that were now subject to this intense compression. Then, as a result of compression, you have no air, no oxygen, so things like fester and boil, basically. Um, they heat up. Um, and then what happens, because as I said before, it, rocks are not uh, solid. They're porous, many, not all. And this is what gets interesting, is that the oil and gas will float upward over once it's turned into oil or gas through rock layers and cracks in the rock and then it'll hit like a cap of non-porous rock and form these reservoirs. Uh, at which point, that's what you're looking for when you are a gambling, drilling man, usually. Uh, and then you hope you're gonna like stick your drill in there and you're gonna get like a massive bonanza of oil. Right? <laughs> so that's like the process. 
So I went to these chefs and I said, what can we do with this structure that is about eating? And they were like, oh, it's so obvious. Uh, you have all these in the second column, kitchen techniques that will map perfectly to, um, to these steps of like oil becoming, oil becoming. Uh, you have the idea of things blooming, uh, mixing oils and waters, uh, salt curing food, right? Like smoked salmon or smoked food. Um, often is, can be just salt cured, like bacalao. Uh, salt baking, where you bake inside a cave of really thick amount of salt. Uh, fermenting, which is anaerobic, uh, ox <laughs> lack of oxygen, for, you know, and, and the addition of microbes changing the constitution of beer, or sourdough, or pickles. <laughs> Uh, and then you have heating and clarifying. Those are techniques used in when you make consomme, uh, fine soups, uh, broths, and then adding oils, which is a common thing done to add oils to liquids, sort of like drops of oil, especially in Asian cooking, also in certain soups, uh, and then it, things being encrusted and then things melting. So we took these two structures and then we designed a meal for Houston. Um, and now you can see the third, the third column is the menu and the poetics of the meal. And so those were expressed. So you had, in the beginning, you have water. We served iceberg water. You can get bottled iceberg water from New Finland for two bucks a bottle. <laughs> They're not chopping the icebergs down. <laughs> it's not quite that bad. Uh, but the icebergs are more and more floating off the lab, you know, through the Labrador current from Iceland. <laughs> and these people have found a good opportunity. You have fossilized water. It's very pure. Very pure, 10,000-year-old water. So we served some water, and then we served some blue-green algae, and then we served um, a salad with salt-cured fish from the Gulf, and then we served a baked, salt-baked Gulf mullet. I'll show you some photos. And then we served fermented food, and then we served, talk about migration, we served a gumbo, a deconstructed gumbo. So you get the idea, like all of the dishes resonated on several levels. They were a chronicle of time a chronicle of our relationship to petrochemicals in, in a lot of different ways that were embedded in the food. We served farmed salmon. We served um, invasive boar sausage. We served um, local beer. Uh, and we talked about energy production. So it was a long meal. It was three hours of discussion. And I didn't do that much talking. I basically would make a toast. The meal was served. And then there was a lot of theatrics and interactivity designed into the meal itself including I did seven menus on vinyl, and then you had a little bag behind your chair, and every course you'd pull the menu off and put it in your bag, and then you would have like the next course. So it was a real opportunity to have a bunch of extra information without me blathering at people like I am now. Um, and then uh, here's some pictures from the first course, which was the marine microorganisms blooming and settling. So we have um, an eyedropper with very dense uh, spirulina, blue-green algae, which is Anybody drink smoothies with that stuff? Yeah. People drink this. Um, and those are the same cyanobacteria that were probably part of the Cambrian die-off that became the oil that you now use. <clears throat> so this condensed dropper in a glass of Houston tap water, and everybody would then take their dropper and watch this beautiful Prussian blue liquid, viscous liquid, like bloom into the cup, and then drink a shot. Um, I, I don't have as many pictures as I thought I had on this site, but um, one of the courses we served was jellyfish sorbet um, to talk about kind of gulf ecology shifting like I talked about in Slurb. Um, it was, jellyfish is tasteless, it's just crunchy. It's really good for you. Uh, but it, so it's a very versatile food if you want a crunch. So we made, <laughs> you're looking at me like, uh, we made a sorbet, like a granita, kind of crunchy granita with Texas ruby grapefruit, which has a whole other story to it, which is amazing because it's from an irradiated seed in the, in the 70s. That's where it, I mean, everything has come from some incredibly strange engineered place at this point. So it's fascinating. Uh, and then we topped this sorbet with a, a Texas Gulf oyster. And we talked about the relative age of these uh, creatures and how well they've both done evolutionarily, but who's going to win now? Definitely jellyfish. <laughs> so um, we, this is, a, this is a, uh, a dome of clear aspic made from sake and um, gelatin. And in these domes, 
were bits of sea life, a shrimp or seaweed, and they were placed in the bottom of your bowl and then poured hot consomme on top with all these deconstructed gumbo elements, and then somebody would come around and drop a little bit of fake truffle oil. If you buy truffle, don't buy truffle oil. It's all made out of bimisomethylcane. It is a, don't quote me, that's not exactly, bimisomethylcane. It's a, it's a petroleum that tastes enough like truffles. Yeah, it's, it, don't buy it. It's like, it costs two cents to make and $20 to buy. Don't buy it. And so I wonder about the um, chefs and the various people that prepare these <laughs> things. They must have had to develop a certain expertise because these... Oh, we worked for like months. Foods, right? We worked for months. Yeah. So we would set up a test kitchen in New York before we went to Rice, and we would get together and eat the most repulsive things. I mean, there were, there were times when we were like, we tried crickets in... Um, we tried to make snacks for the have-nots so we could talk about class because this dinner was really expensive and really exclusive. 50 spots, it's not a lot of spots. So we were gonna make food for the have-nots outside, packaged, um, what is that corn, corn, you know, corn muffin premix? It's like really classic. Yeah. Uh, with crickets, yeah. Jiffy, yeah. with crickets in it. It was so disgusting. Uh, tasting and so we always there's a baseline it has to taste great um, yeah so the final thing I'll say so well, I'll say two more things um, the meal was served by ten actors um, who who posed as waiters and they had you know nice black waiter outfits on and over the course of the first the first four plates in, which included like people having to take a giant ball of salt and egg whites and get in there to get to their mullet so the, this was a mess, and no one cleaned anything up. So the table just kind of quietly accumulated waste, and nobody talked about it. We had discovered this in Boston. Like, it was like an accident when we had done the first run of this, and I was like, we need to totally deal. This is just the best opportunity. So right before the oyster sorbet, which was like the break point before humans start drilling, uh, these guys come back out in these yellow aprons, and they very aggressively stack all of the plates into this kind of sculpture down the middle of this long table. So when I began the meal, I talked about, pa it was Passover. It was like trying to talk about Passover and social sculpture as a, as a and it really was a kind of social sculpture because people had to participate so oddly with this whole, with the food and the mechanics and then people coming and getting all the plates out. And the middle of the table was a runner that I had made with five students. Uh, beautiful, I think maybe you can see it here. Yeah, this is styrofoam. Then we, they had dumpster dough for like two weeks and collected all this clean styrofoam. And so when I got to rice, the room quarter of this big was filled. And so we had this amazing palette of shapes to make almost like a beautiful architectural cityscape. And then that became all the niches and nooks and shelves that, that, um, that this sculpture became. I, I need to work on the documentation for this clearly. Uh, and then the last course was, um, uh, drilling and gushing, and everyone had a metal straw, and then they would have to bash through this hard top dessert to get to the one bit of alcohol that we served at the meal, which was the bottom <laughs> of the dessert. So it was really a kind of fantastic exam example. Uh, you know, it was like a living example of something, and the room was utterly silent because it was really delicious. Um, okay, so, so good, I got a few minutes to talk about this new work. I'm gonna do my best. I'm, I'm gonna not show you some more of the social practice craziness. I've started doing, I do a lot of workshops. I do a lot of brainstorming with people now. Um, and it's been very fruitful to do these kind of future scenario narrative development with people. Uh, so there's some stuff on my website. I can send the link. It's not really very visible, but I can send it to Michael. So <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, this, is, this is the show that just opened at Bitforms. Um, maybe I'll start with this. So uh, this is, um, <laughs> well, okay, the show is called More and More, the parenthesis, The Invisible Oceans. And what happened is I've been doing all this work on rivers and Superfund sites and polluted spaces, and I've been really interested in how cities kind of consider the edges of their nature, nature opportunity to be their ports and their, you know, that have often been turned into tourist sites and they've been very parkified. But I became very interested in how these rivers are just arteries connected to this vast ocean space 
that nobody really knows about and nobody really deals with. And then I, I had read Stacey Alimo, who's a theorist who works a lot on oceans, an essay that she wrote called Violet Black. And she just restated the fact that 78.5% of the world's habitable space is deep sea, under 2,000 meters. And, out is it, and then 5% is shallow sea, and only 20% of habitable space is actually on land. So that's kind of mind-blowing. And we actually probably know more about Mars at this point than we do about the deep sea. And we've mapped the ocean floor, but we have no idea what's down there. And people are now beginning to really look at it as uh, resource exploitation possibilities because we've run out of so much biodiversity on land and they're speculating that there's tons more biodiversity in the deep seas. So on my way to this exciting exploration, I ran into import-export maritime shipping um, because I've been interested in consumption and because I felt critical of myself that I didn't deal with economics and kind of human social space as part of the environmental kind of concerns that I had. And because the code really freaked me out, <laughs> to be frank. So what this is, is um, it's called the Harmonized System Tariff Code. You know what this is. Oh, from shipping artwork. You know, everyone who ships artwork knows what this is. It's, it, it's 90, it's like the 98th chapter. Yeah. Um, there's 26,000 items that constitute legal import and export just to and from the United States. There's probably more like 50,000 items, categories, that constitute everything that's legally shippable. That's not including illegal things, but illegal things are often shipped under and through this codified system. This system then is executed in the form of containers on ships that are literally 10 to 13 city blocks long. Nobody knows what's in the containers really. There's no centralized space of knowledge at all. So it was very amazing to try to get a grip on this. And we've been really thinking about how we being, I have two collaborators on the data part of this project, we've been really thinking a lot about how maritime shipping obliterates oceans and replaces it with a Pangea. You know what Pangea is? Old, the Pangea of capitalism. That's really ignorant, indifferent to labor, indifferent to difference, simply a flattened conceptual black box of a space that you can sort of think about through containerization as, as, not, as a literal example and a really powerful metaphor. So that's how I got here. Am I OK on time, or do you need to stop? OK. Just give me five minute warning so I can get right, to some yeah, pictures. OK. Are you kidding? You got to the Pangea? We can you right? up on this one. All right. These, I started to put these in order, but I don't think they're super in order. Um, looking for kind of skeleton keys to get into this world. Um, I made two books for the exhibition through the same print-on-demand publishers who did the petroleum book with me. They're fantastic. They're called Punctum Books. Um, and we did this book, which is more like just a traditional catalog for the show, and then we did another book, which is the entire Harmonized System Code for the United States, that authors were invited to write footnotes for different objects. So there's about 120 authored entries that intervene into this otherwise, this wall of code. But I'll just show you a couple of pictures. So this is before the show opened. Um, I had to put this catalog together, and um, some of this is very absurd. I'll just get to the part that is, uh, okay. So the four, there's 99 chapters, two-digit code, that are all the categories that um, things could be in. So you have live animals, meat, fish, dairy, animal origin stuff, metals, petroleum-based stuff, plastics-based stuff, Drinkable things, um, miscellaneous edible preparations. Uh, and then this is towards the end of it. Uh, you have like carpets, you have synthetic threads, you have textiles, you have clothing, etc. I mean, it's really kind of crazy. So in my, my way of doing things to get to know things is to draw and to transcribe and to see what I can discover. So, so I drew the icons 
for the four-digit code. So this is the two-digit code. The four-digit code is 1,250 things. And then it expands exponentially. I have, I'm not going any further. This was enough. But it was really uh, claustrophobic. It really it took weeks. And uh, I didn't hand draw. All. I, I modified what I would find. So I was going to stock footage websites. I was Googling like diamond vector. And then I would pick something. And then I would just kind of uniform, make everything somewhat uniform in my typical thieving fashion. Um, and so then, I mean, one of the things I did, this is not in the show, these are just ridiculous. I just started taking that and say, well, what if you start to make these absurd drawings? What can you actually say with these things? Um, but I'm getting to, I'll show you some animations before we stop, but um, yeah. So one of the things that I was really interested in is taking those export icons and turning them back into products. So I, I um, found free 3D models of some of the top export items. Frozen chickens, believe it or not, top export item from Brazil. Um, oil cans, weapons, rare wood. Revolution counters, one of the top export items from Mexico. And I rendered, so, so I made molds, silicone molds from these 3D models that we had printed. I got them printed in NYU, they were pretty cheap. Made silicone molds, they're all exactly the same size. Uh, and then grew them in fungus. So I grew them in mycelium, which uh, from oyster mushrooms, you can take fungus and feed it some kind of agricultural waste and it'll turn into a kind of a glue as it eats its way through its food source and you'll end up with this beautiful styrofoam-like sculptural object. So I just, I just wanted to show you that. Sometimes they'll grow, which is phenomenal. That's the back of one of the little computers. Uh, they're very beautiful. Uh, so front of the gallery, you, you see this in the window. OK, good. Uh, this is also in the front of the gallery. Uh, I tried to think about like a masthead from a ship and a sense of like the ocean being obscured by all of these icons. Um, then we did this thing called the More and More Store. And the store was several things. It was these objects in triplicate from their original, the 3D print of the idealized form to the fungus. And then we, we made these bathing suits. Uh, and if you go to this, the website moreandmore.world, you can go through the process of making a bathing suit yourself. And what these bathing suits are, um, are uh, visualizations of trade relations between two countries. So there's an amazing website called the Observatory of Economic Complexity that's run by MIT that has done beautiful uh, trade data visualizations. And you can look them up look up things by object, or you can look up things by country relations, and see who's exporting what to whom, at what volume, and what percentage of their own economic uh, holding these objects constitute. They have an open API, which we used, to then um, build this website where you can say, I want a cell phone. Um, the gradients on the bathing suits are the country you're in. So I'm in the US, I want a cell phone. Uh, cell phones are made and then it'll give you a choice of like six or seven countries. You say, I'll oh, come from China. And then it will produce a textile for you with everything else that might have come in that container with your cell phone from China. So in a way, it was, it was a lot of people have said, I don't really, why bathing suits? And I'm like, see, here's one of those visual things where it sounds kind of dumb when I say it, but we're like tiny little mortals. You're going to go in the ocean against this like ocean of, products and I want you to feel really small and really hyper aware of of that relation the monumentalism of this the monumentality of this system and the ships the scale and size of that against your smallness and how do you feel any agency in this discussion of consumption how do you feel how do you feel it how do you how is it like materially felt so that's like a question I'm really I don't think I've succeeded necessarily in any of this I hope you do go see the show there's um, there's, the, there's the store, and then there's um, also uh, a room of containerized animations from uh, eight major, six major port nations. And these pieces explore both cultural and uh, product export. So we, again, using uh, search engines, try to find the kind of textile and um, representational patterns that we think of as Turkish or we think of as Mexican or 
we think of as from the United States and, and leverage those using the same software that I showed you in the other pieces to make these recombinant sort of delirious worlds that represent these countries. So I think I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> I can put up an animation while, you, if you have any questions. Or I can just put up an animation or you can, you can go away. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, this isn't gonna work very well. Yeah. Nobody likes to do that. I'll repeat the question so you don't have to feel shy. Well, I feel that um, you know, you're, what you've done is kind of open up your kind of research project, the way you go about doing things, the way mm -hmm. you're thinking about the connection between the things you work with and stuff like that. And uh, you know, at lunch we were talking and you told me that you'd spent 10 years out of the art world. Right. And I wonder if you developed uh, skills through that experience that, you know, we think of art, you know, formal terms mm -hmm. or material terms or something like that, sometimes conceptual terms, or, you know, more and more people are thinking of conceptual terms. What did you learn in those 10 years that brought you back in? That you I know, hate clients. <laughs> <laughs> it's that simple, huh? <laughs> um, no. It's not that simple. I do, I do hate clients because most of them I, I just don't have the tolerance to make work that somebody else thinks they know why they would possibly want to sell this thing. Um, and, and I felt like I was always competing with myself because I was still making things. And so then making animations and making work for MTV or for other people, I felt like I was just competing with myself for my own time. I really enjoy teaching. It just took a long time for me to have a confidence to get to the point where I loved I love teaching. It's been the perfect complement to work because especially where I teach, so much access to technology and to uh, experimental research, and both through the university at large and also just through ITP, through the kind of material research people are doing. Um, what did I learn? Uh, I learned how to produce things. I produced really terrible low-budget horror movies for five years when I got out of art school, and they would basically hand us like $25,000 and say, come back with like a stripper cage, a sci-fi stripper cage and um, you know, a mutant pit. And so I learned how to produce. I learned how to manage money and produce things on deadline. Uh, I learned how to write pitch proposals, I guess, sometimes. Um, I learned a lot about culture. I worked for Japanese television for four years both in, in the United States and I learned a lot about culture and cultural uh, Tra translation and a pop culture. I was really into Japan and Japanese pop and Japanese art in general and principles of art making. So that was really great. So where did you learn? Uh, and, and you know, obviously you're a researcher. You're a voracious researcher. Right? Where did you learn about that? How did you develop your skills as a researcher? Was it in school or was it? No, I think I think it was from Japanese television. So I was the in-office researcher pre-internet. So this is like 89, 90, 91. And my job, <laughs> I worked for a year and a half on a show called Mrs. America, Come See My House. Has anybody read My Year of Meats? This book by Ruth Ozeki, or, or did anyone read Tale for the Time Being? Came out a couple years ago. So she was my, she was my like, uh, she was the Japanese translator who would go on the road with these people. A really dear friend of mine, and she got me into this Japanese TV thing because we couldn't work in the film business anymore. It was, it was too hard. The art department stuff was too hard for nothing. Terrible. Uh, and so my job was to find families around the United States who were willing to have a Japanese TV crew come and live with them for two weeks and cook a beef dish since the show was paid for by the U.S. Beef Export Federation. <laughs> so I would call, I would call, uh, agricultural extension offices, churches, local newspapers, and say like, who's interesting? Who's photogenic? Who's cool? You know, and so, and after like a year, Ruth and I were like, wow, we're not getting you normal families anymore. So when we started getting like lesbian bull riders and people who adopted like 13 children of Korean prostitutes and, you know, we were like, too bad. You're out of, you're out of luck. Like, then we, so we got to be really good. I got to be a really crack researcher. And the other thing I did, I worked for the National Enquirer when I was a prop. I was like an outside prop shopper and commercials for a while. Again, right when I got out of school. And again, no internet. And you would literally, they would come to town and work with this post-production facility. Uh, and you would, they'd be like, okay, I need a purple jackhammer 
and I need like $3,000 worth of towels you can return to Bed Bath & Beyond, and I need six things. And then everywhere you went, you would phone them, say, I'm just checking, and they go, oh, we changed the story completely. Now you need to find this other thing. And then I'd be like, can I use your phone? I need to find like 700 beakers, glass beakers. So then I'm in like your office in the Bronx at the Jackhammer place on the phone, right? So I got very good at researching. I think it's just part. And then I love, na I love, I'm, I can't remember any actors' names, but I can remember every artist's name and the Latin names of many, many plants. So I'm clearly like on the spectrum and to some degree. I, I mean no disrespect. I, I really mean I must, I have like a weird thing about details, so. Is this an example of what's at Bitforms now? Yeah, so these are in the boxes. So those boxes look like miniature metal containers. And each of them has a different country, different nation in it. This is Japan. I was just going to say, we were watching Japan. Yeah, good. I'm glad you can get I'll just put another one on so you can guess. Especially the vertical format. Yeah. Well, um, six of them are vertical and two of them are horizontal. Okay. Um, okay. Well, it started, they were all going to be vertical because I really love the kind of scroll. Yeah, yeah love that. But um, I ended up wanting to stack these as sculptural pieces. You notice none of them are on the wall. They're all stackable. So, well, Texas, is a Texas. Texas could be a country if they had their way. Exactly. So could New York, though. Nope. Yep. So they're 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 kind of fun. It was unfair because uh, it hasn't I done enough yet. So there's some. Years. See, here's some. Um, no, that's that's wheat. That's wheat. Top export products are kind of always in the background. <laughs> and all of them share this sort of 24-7 transport, all of the kind of languages of transport. It's just, I don't know if this one is. So are these, are these pieces too? Yeah. Okay, so they're, they're always different? Or yeah. They're running? Oh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, they're, I wouldn't say always different, but right. yes, literally they're always different, but Sometimes I don't think you would notice they're all that different. Now There's you're the coder. Are you? I am not the coder. You're not the coder. So you work. So but that is a sort of a regular practice in your work. No, you I sure do no code. No, no. What I mean is that you make sure that the pieces are are computational video. Now I do. Yeah. Yeah. So that's always a factor. Now it is. Yeah. Thing. What application or language did it? God, these are done by the last living Flash action script coder in the universe. <laughs> so now I'm doing a new piece on WebGL. Uh, that because the the new piece is all. Um, but no, WebGL is better. We're now doing That's a composite of. That, oh yeah, this is this is fine. But if you ever want to do real time any real time data, so we're doing a piece called Flight, which is about visualizing the poetics of airspace. So we're we're using flight tracking and bird watching data and UFO, there's even databases for UFO sightings. So we're doing a lot of asynchronous but real time data polls to, to animate airspace at the airport. And it, it'll find the airport nearest where you are. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that we're, we're doing WebGL. And all, also all the weather is dynamic. It's all done and it's all, it's all code as opposed to drawings, so. Yeah, it was nice to get to use color again. I, I have for, forbidden myself from using any color in my work for the last four years. So this is good. All the videos have the sun? Or the yeah, it's, it's, so these are um, running on computer clock time. And so where the sun or the moon are is, is dependent on what port the time zone is set to. Yeah, so in the gallery, you'll see the sun is all over the place. You know what's crazy? China is all one time zone. That blew my mind. Yeah. How is that? It's China. <laughs> it's remarkable. It's political. But it's crazy. Because of a political decision. Yeah. Yeah. So please, I hope you get to go see the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yay. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your kind attention.